Act 5, Scene 1. Um, the building background talks about uh, sleepwalking as usually this, a sign of a, a troubled mind, a troubled psyche. Somebody that uh, you know, can't sleep peacefully is troubled and has some inner demons, um, some guilt, something that uh, keeps them from, from sleeping peacefully. Uh, this particular scene is Lady Macbeth's most famous scene um, where she utters the words, out, out, damn spot, where um, people are witnessing her sleepwalking and she's constantly doing this with her hands. Out, out, damn spot. What do you think she's referring to? Blood. Blood. Okay, that motif. The, she even is having the guilt that no matter how much she washes, she still sees spots, blood, splatter. Okay, and, um, and so she's troubled by that. Um, this is really her swan song, her, uh, her, her big um, going out of the play scene in that, um, you know, this is really her last time that we see her. Um, we hear about her later on, but this is kind of her, her last big uh, stage moment. Um, pay attention to uh, the doctor and the, the chamber woman who is watching her and how they talk. Um, you know, and I don't know if you've ever talked to somebody who, maybe not necessarily sleepwalking, but they talk in their sleep and have com can have conversations. Um, it's kind of weird sometimes. Um, and yet she's talking to herself and she does certain actions uh, nightly or pretty regularly um, that she's been witnessed doing these before. Um, and there's a line that she says things that she should not know of. Um, and so, you know, it's almost like a confession to some degree and other people are hearing of it. Um, but it's interesting to note, uh, remember how I've talked and stressed from the beginning the roles of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, how strong a characters they were, and especially Lady Macbeth, and how he's seen her role change and go up and down throughout this play. You know, uh, when, it, when it's really necessary and when Macbeth has needed some support, she's right there to, to push him forward. Um, here is where we see her at her weakest, uh, her weakest moment, and she really is a shell of what she was uh, at the beginning, which can be considered tragic also. Um, throughout this act, we will see those tragic flaws that we've talked about earlier. We will see the, the payout uh, for having those and what they uh, ultimately what, uh, you know, what happens as a result of having those uh, negative impacts on their lives. So scene one, um, <clears throat> in Macbeth's castle at Dunstanay, we see Lady Macbeth uh, well, actually, she, we don't see her yet. We see the doctor talking to the gentlewoman. Um, and the doctor right, says, I, I have two nights watch with you, but there's been no truth to your reports. You, you've told me that she walks in her sleep, but I've sat here for two nights watching, and that hasn't happened. Well, she, she's coming. She, she does this a lot. Um, he wants to know, have you heard her say anything? Line 12, 13, 14, around in there. Oh, that, sir, which I will not report after her. Well, you made to me, and tis most meet you should, so you, you should tell me. But she's afraid to, to even mention the things that she's heard. Okay, the foul things, the guilty things, okay, the condemnable things uh, that she's done. She doesn't want to repeat, you know, hearsay, that type of thing. I don't want to be gossipy. You know, I, no, I'll let you, if you hear her say it, then you hear it out of her mouth, but not from me. Um, um, here she comes. So she comes walking out, and as it says, she's unaware that others are watching her because she's sleepwalking. He comments that her eyes are open, but she goes, but her senses are shut. Okay, she's walking, looking around, you know, just doesn't see anything. And she goes through certain actions and does certain deeds, uh, repetition, and then goes back to bed. And, the, you know, the gentlewoman character's name, she's witnessed these a couple times. Um, the doctor notices, look how she rubs her hands. Oh, it is an accustomed action with her to seem thus washing her hands. And that's where we know what she's doing before she even mentions about the blood. Okay, because there was a whole thing about Macbeth. You know, will all the wa great Neptune's ocean wash these hands clean? And he goes, no, it'll turn blood. And then she comes in and goes, look, a little washing takes care of this deed. At the time, she was fine with it, you know, the action of it. But here in her mind with this guilt, she cannot get the blood out. It is soaked into her hand. Um, and I've known her to continue this for a quarter an hour. So for 15 minutes, she sits there and does this stuff. Yet, here's another spot. Hark, she speaks. I will set down what comes from her. So you can imagine, whatever she said, I'm going to write down. Oh, she's going to talk. OK. OK, and the stuff she starts talking about. I mean, it's almost like a confession. Um, and it's, it, it's amazing. Out, 
damn spot out, I say. You know, blah, blah, blah. You know, the Thane of Wife, or the Thane of Fife had a wife. Where is she now? You know, who would have thought that the old man have had so much blood in him? Okay, so mentioning the murders of um, Macduff's family and Macduff's wife, talking about the old man with the amount of blood he has in, knowing that he was killed uh, in her house. And, Doctor, did you hear that? Do you mark that? Um, the Thane of Fife had a wife. Where was she now? Um, go, go to, go to, go away, gentlewoman. You have known what you should not. You know, you don't want to hear any more of this. You, you, don't, you, you don't want to know this stuff. She goes, well, she has spoke what she should not. I am sure of that. Heaven knows what she has known. The doctor ultimately says that, you know, the disease is beyond my practice. Okay, yet I have known those which have walked in their sleep who have died holily. So what he was saying earlier is a little bit to what I alluded to before we uh, went through this was that, you know, a lot of people with, with problems, um, you know, mentally or guilt, they sleepwalk. Um, and so he goes, well, I've known people who have died holy in the bed who are good people. So it's not always a bad thing. So maybe this isn't legit. Um, but Lady Macbeth to bed to bed and, and she leaves. Um, the doctor's last little uh, thing to the gentlewoman, line 68, around in there, you know, unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. Infected minds to their deaf pillows will discharge their secrets. So infected minds to their deaf pillows will speak to their pillows, will confess throughout their sleep. Um, uh, and more needs she the divine than the physician. So she needs more help from a priest. She needs some confession. She needs some, instead of a physician, a doctor. There's nothing that I, doctor, can do for her. It's all something that she needs to take care of up here or find somebody that can uh, listen to her and help, uh, help with that. Um, he says, look after her, remove from her the means of all annoyances. So anything that she can injure herself, um, you know, almost like a suicide watch. Um, if you've ever seen that in, uh, you know, psychiatric wars or prisons, they'll take your shoestrings, they'll take your bed sheets, you know, things like that so you can't, you know, harm yourself. Um, and he says, just in case, you know, you just... Keep an eye on her and make sure everything's out of, out, of, uh, out of her way. Scene two. This is very important that you pay attention uh, for the rest of the act on these scenes because they're going to jump locations all over. Okay? And it's, it's very uh, easy to get confused if you're not paying attention. But if you're seeing what's happening and where we're jumping to, it'll make a lot of sense. Um, so scene two is in the countryside near Dunsinane. Um, and so we're getting pretty close okay, to, uh, to Macbeth's place. And we're going to listen to um, uh, some other thanes, some other generals, uh, Scottish generals for Macbeth, uh, talking about their motivations for fighting, and ultimately they come up with uh, a big decision. So see if you can uh, understand what that is. Scene two. Um, if you're not reading the direction, not the direction, the stage directions, the actor notes, um, it might be a little confusing, especially with some of these characters that we haven't seen before or we saw only briefly. Um, the soldiers enter with the Scottish noblemen. So some Scottish noblemen, and notice they're on their way to join forces with the English army. So they are openly rebelling against Macbeth. Okay, so they're on the march, and that's why at the very end, the very last line, when they say, well, we'll make our march toward Burnham, does that sound familiar? Just the word Burnham? Do you remember what one of the, the prophecies was? You know, Macbeth will never vanquish be until great Burnham Woods marches on Dunsinane. Okay? And so these little things should start coming up like, uh, well, it looks like the armies are amassing for a big charge, and where are they meeting at? Well, it looks like they're heading towards Burnham. Okay, so Burnham Woods. So things should start going up. Oh, oh, I wonder if something's going to happen as a result of that. Um, we find out more and more about, uh, you know, the, about what they think about Macbeth. They call him a tyrant again. You know, what does the tyrant, where's the tyrant, what's he doing? Uh, Caithness says, great Dunsinane, he strongly fortifies. Some say he's mad. You know, not like angry, -er, but, you know, it, some thinks he's crazy. Others that lesser hate him do call it valiant fury. Um, uh, Angus, now does he feel his secret murder sticking on his hands? So now is he feeling guilt because of what he was doing? Is he resenting what he was doing? Is he resenting everybody else because they aren't openly accepting what he did? Um, those he commands move only in command, nothing in love. That's a very important statement. 
even those people that are still being commanded by Macbeth, they're doing it not out of love, but only in command, that that's, that's their duty. Okay? And so that's why when we see all of these noblemen openly marching uh, to join the opposition, okay, those people are screaming it that we're against you, Macbeth. The people that maybe can't or aren't in position to do so, the little soldiers, they probably just, you know, they're stuck. Because if they say anything, they'll probably be killed. Um, and so they're not behind Macbeth. Macbeth is completely on his own, is what is being said here. Okay, everybody else seems to be amassing in order to take out uh, the, the tyrant that we hear about. Um, good. And then that last line, like I said, line 31, you know, make we our march toward Burnham. So heading towards Burnham Wood. Very important and very significant because it was something mentioned a while ago. Uh, scene three, the castle of Dunsinane. Um, we're going to see Macbeth. Um, you know, people have just alluded to that he's, uh, have some, he might have gone crazy. There's some violent fury. Um, he, a couple scenes ago, we heard, you know, at the end of uh, Act 4, you know, that he was having some open rebellions. And so he's not just sitting back with his feet up on the throne. He's trying to hold on to what he has. Um, so look at how he's dealing with everything, with the traitors, in his mind, leaving in order to uh, amass an army, see what he thinks about them. Um, he's talking to the doctor about his wife because he knows that his wife isn't well. Um, so pay particular attention to uh, Macbeth's ups and downs, ups and downs. <laughs> Scene three, the castle at Dunsinane. Um, <clears throat> remember, I told you to keep an eye on his, his personality, his thoughts, his action. Because you always have to keep in mind what the witches were telling him, okay, or what they did tell him, um, and how that was supposed to make him, when he was supposed to be smart, it was supposed to, you know, he was supposed to go against it. Because they tell him things that make him overconfident. And so he says, bring me no more reports. Let them all fly. Let all those stains leave. Let everybody who doesn't want to fight with me, you know, who doesn't believe me, go. Because I'm going to defeat them anyways. So it doesn't matter. Let them all go. I have nothing to fear, you know, till Burnham Wood removed to Dunsane. He mentions it here. He mentions it at the very end of this scene. And so you can see that that is what he's considering maybe the most impossible an improbable thing to happen because the trees cannot walk across. Burnham Wood cannot march on Dunsinane. It's, it can't happen. And don't forget about the one with, uh, you know, man of woman born. Well, so really, I, since every man is born a woman, I have nothing to fear from mankind. And so this is what he's really holding on to is, I don't, I don't care. I don't care. Until Burnham Wood marches, I have nothing to fear. Um, and so that's really where his, uh, his cockiness and arrogance you know, he says, fly, false things, fly, go away, leave. Um, the servant comes in, sir, th there is 10,000 geese, villain, geese. No, no, soldiers, sir. Well, go prick thy face and overread thy fear. Because the guy's so pale, 10,000, I mean, that's a lot of people to see coming and marching and, and amassing and coming towards you. And so he's pale, he goes, go prick thy, you know, get some blood and put some color in your cheeks. Okay, you're... You're a fool. You're a coward. Okay, I'm not scared of 10,000 men. What, what, geese? Is that what you're afraid of? And so he's really not concerned at all. And so we see Macbeth really um, being that defiant individual. Um, dun, 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 dun. Uh, Satan appears. Satan, uh, what's your uh, gracious pleasure? What news more? Well, all is confirmed, my lord, which was reported. I'll fight till from my bones my flesh be hacked. Give me my armor. So Macbeth could sit back. A lot of times generals and kings typically don't fight. Have you seen those movies where they are usually, you know, have telescopes and they're way in the back and they're watching? Okay, send in the third battalion. For, you know, there's the, um, the strategists. They're not down there fighting. You know, Braveheart is a, you know, he wasn't the king, but yet he was down there fighting with them. Um, here, Macbeth, he has nothing to fear of humans. And so he goes, give me my armor. I'm going to go out. Okay, remember, he was very good with his sword from what we heard about him from the first act. And so he wants to go out and wants to fight and probably wants some, uh, some bloodlust and kill some people. Okay, uh, kill some of those traitors that are leaving him, maybe. Um, you know, I'll, I'll put it on. You know, you don't need it yet. You don't need it. Well, why do you, you're not going to fight. You know, I'll put it on. 
Send out more horses, scur the country round, hang those that talk of fear. So those individuals who were just doing what was commanded, you know, if this individual is telling, you know, Macbeth's telling people to, to kill those that are fearful, those that are thinking of leaving, um, we can see a lot of, uh, a, a lot of fear that, that he's ruling with. Um, then lastly, he's talking to the doctor. Not a huge plot point here other than the fact that uh, Macbeth wants her to cure her of that. Um, because he says that she has, um, you know, uh, she's troubled. Well, cure her. Pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow. You know, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart. So help her. Well, therein the patient must minister to himself. So that's the same thing he said to the gentlewoman. This is not something that a physician can take care of. This is something that she needs to take care of herself or find, you know, a priest is what he said to the gentlewoman earlier. Um, he goes, throw physic to the dog, all none of it. Throw medicine, you know, who needs medicine? I mean, gee, what, what good are you? What good are you? I want her cured. You know, if thou couldst, doctor, cast the water of my land and find her disease and purge it to a sound and pristine health, I would applaud thee to the very echo. So if you can do this, I will be very grateful. And it's always good to have the king, uh, you know, owe you a favor. Okay, so he'd be very, very pleased. Um, the king, Macbeth, takes off and he goes, I will not be afraid of death and bane till Burnham would come to Dunsinane. So once again, there is that, uh, that little, um, you know, statement again, always in his mind. And then the doctor has his little comedic line, you know, were I from Dunsinane away and clear, profit again should hardly draw me here. So you couldn't pay me enough to come back to this place if I were fortunate enough to, to escape and get away from here. Money couldn't bring me back to deal with I, I wouldn't say the craziness that's going around here, but the, the demonic visions that this woman is spewing out, and he sees the way that Macbeth is um, acting, and so I need, you couldn't pay me to come back here, should I flee. Scene four is in the countryside near Burnham Woods, so pay particular attention. Uh, that is a key point. Um, you know, this is where everybody is amassing. This is a sh very short scene, and we'll see Malcolm kind of leading the charge and talking to the different thanes and the noblemen, um, you know, all, the, all those other escaped thanes and such. Um, and then look at what Malcolm's plan for attack ultimately involves. <laughs> okay, so the Malcolm's text um, on 395 uh, in the blue there, Look at his plan. Remember, they are in Burnham Wood. Look at what his plan is to march across the field and attack Dunsinane. Let every soldier hew him down a bow, a bow, excuse me, and bear it before him. Thereby shall we shadow the numbers of our host and make discovery air in report of us. So let's just say we have 10,000 people here. Let's cut down some of the trees, some of the branches, and hide behind it as we march across. And so they won't be able to look out and go, one, two, three, four, ten thousand. They might be able to go, one, two, two thousand, two, four thousand. They won't be able to know. Okay? But what's it going to look like from the best point of view? Trees are marching. Do you see how that prophecy is coming true or will come true? You know, but it's silly. The trees aren't, they never said that the trees, they just said till Burnham Wood marches. And Boughs of trees from Burnham Wood, that's Burnham Wood. So wood from Burnham is marching across. Okay? Remember, that was the point. It was supposed to be completely obvious to Macbeth that nobody could, you know, take me down, but yet the subtext was, you know, you're gonna go down. Okay, and Burnham Wood is going to march. Um, scene five and scene six, but scene five is the castle of Dunsinane. Um, so we're back with Macbeth. Um, you know, they are getting ready to uh, march, okay, across towards him. He is going to hear reports come to him that Burnham Wood is marching. How do you think he's going to respond to that? Okay, pay particular attention to that. Does he keep his arrogance up? Is he now scared? Is he doubly confident? Okay, because remember, he still has that other prophecy to keep in mind. You know, no man of woman born will ever harm me. Okay, so he still has that to hold on to. Um, so pay particular attention to this, uh, the, these two short scenes um, and how he responds to hearing about them marching across and then ultimately, you know, keep an eye on his evolution or de-evolution as a character. Thanks.
excuse me, scene five, the castle at Dunsany. Um, Macbeth is still very, uh, the same he was, the, the, the same very uh, uh, strong individual that he was uh, a scene ago, two scenes ago. Um, you know, hang out our banners on the outward walls. The cry is still, they come. Our castle's strength will laugh a siege to scorn. So no one can, you know, remember, that's where he heavily fortified himself. So there's no way they're ever going to take this castle. Okay, so he's still very, very confident about that. Um, you know, he hears a cry from within the castle. What is that noise? It's the cry of a woman. Huh. Oh, I've almost forgot the taste of fears. You know, people being scared and cries and, and the wailings of war and how people deal with it. Um, but then he finds out that it was in response to the queen that she has died. Okay, um, I told you the last time was last time we see her. Um, she has died. It doesn't say how here. They, um, they figure it out or kind of talk about it um, at the end of the play. Um, but Macbeth's response, uh, because remember, he's focused on this battle and stuff. But yet now it brings back, you know, his love and his wife. And now he is fully alone. And she should have died hereafter. So she should have died later on. This is way too early for her to have died. Um, you know, the couple lines down there towards the bottom, um, you know, out, out, brief candle. It's a very famous line. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Um, it's kind of a, a, a dark way to look at life. But, the, I mean, you light a candle, you blow it out, somebody else walks in a room, they could never tell that that candle was even lit, even if it had been a glorious, beautiful, whatever color flame. It's just like the, the actor that walks across the stage and does his thing and then leaves, and you, that stage is just as empty as it was before that person was even there. And so for all intents and purposes, you know, it never existed. If so-and-so never witnessed it, it never existed. Um, and so life is similar to that. Um, and, you know, it's the, the life, it's so full of sound and fury, but ultimately it means nothing. Life is, is nothing. And so he's kind of, you know, missing his wife a little bit there. And so we get to see kind of, uh, a, a, once again, a different Macbeth, but kind of a Macbeth who's more like what he was earlier in the piece, um, dealing with uh, dealing with this loss, um, he's not such a monster, but um, that changes here momentarily. So a messenger comes in. Um, I should report what I say I saw, but no, not how to do it. I, I need to tell you something, but I don't know how. And ultimately, you know, I don't know how you're going to respond to this. Well, what? Well, say, sir, what was it? As I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked toward Burnham, and anon me thought. The wood began to move, liar and slave. Well, let me endure your wrath if it be not so. Within this three mile may you see it coming. I say a moving grove. And so I did see it. And you do whatever you want to me if I'm lying to you. But I saw what I saw. And of course this is not what he wants to hear, that Burnham Wood is moving towards them. Okay, because that makes him start to think back to the women's sisters. If thou speakest false upon the next tree, shall thou hang alive till famine clean. So I'm going to hang you from a tree until you starve to death, if you are lying to me. <coughs> if this is a joke, you pick the wrong person to joke to and at the wrong time. Um, he thinks back to the witches. I pull in resolution and begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. I begin to, I pull in resolution, footnote, I restrain my confidence. Okay, so my confidence, I'm pulling it back a little bit after hearing upon this. And I'm starking to question those double truths. We, talk, we talked about equivocation earlier. You know, there's uh, something said, but then it's kind of a lie, a subtext of a lie underneath it. And so he starts to question those from the witches. And I'm like, well, if that was a lie, then what else could be? Uh, a mild fabrication, maybe. And that's ultimately... Um, you know, where he's thinking. Because he goes, well, I fear not till Burnham Wood do come to, to Dunsinane. And now a wood come towards Dunsinane. Okay, so he's crushed. Um, the bottom half here, he's uh, decided to go out and fight. He puts on his armor and at least will die with harness on our back, with armor on our back. So he is going to go out and fight now. 
and you know let out some of this 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 anger and loss and all of that. Um, scene six dealt with uh, the, in the countryside. It was showing Malcolm uh, said, "Okay, drop the bows, show our numbers, and attack." Okay, so a lot of this stuff is happening off, off stage because we can't have thousands of people on stage. We can't have we can't have a dozen people fighting on stage. It would be too much commotion. Okay, so they come walking out with their bows, and then if they have bows, maybe it's just imaginary. Maybe they do have props. Um, props were very minimal, uh, you know, back then. Um, and so they come out, hey, we're charging, and then they walk off stage. And you know that in your mind, that's where it is. So when Macbeth exits, you know where he's headed. When these guys come out and come back on, you know where they were or where they are going. Scene seven, in the countryside near the castle, um, you know, this is Macbeth out there fighting. This is war, so we will see some fighting and jou not jousting, but uh, back and forth with swordplay on stage. Um, this is a lot of the action. Um, even though this is a short scene, we only have two more, about four more pages in the whole play. Um, a lot of action takes place, a lot of important dialogue back and forth between Macbeth and his uh, fighters and jousters to some degree. Um, and we do see an appearance from Macduff. So how is Macbeth holding up? Because remember, he was a really good warrior. So his skills are probably pretty good. And especially fueled with the, the notion of no man born of a woman will ever harm me. And so now that Dunsinane, the woods march on Dunsinane, that, I can't really put a lot of stock in that anymore. At least I have this, because everybody's born of a woman. <laughs>
the resolution. Um, they discuss, you know, uh, what happened to Lady Macbeth, that type of thing. So uh, try to uh, answer all those questions. <laughs> Scene eight, uh, with that being the end of it, you know, it was a tragedy, so did it happen the way that you thought it was going to happen? Did the person get the revenge that you thought should get the revenge? I think most of us would probably say, well, yeah, since Bacon was dead, sure, why not Macduff? Um, especially with Macduff's family um, finding the end that they did. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Macbeth and Macduff find each other right off the bat. Uh, Macbeth has a couple phrases to himself. Uh, you know, why should I play the Roman fool and die on mine own sword? Whilst I see lives, the gashes do better upon them. Uh, if you had read Julius Caesar, um, that movie, a lot of the conspirators take their own lives, fall on their swords, have somebody hold them, and you run into them. So in essence, why should I commit suicide? I mean, yes, it, I'm surrounded. Why should I when there's a lot of people who the wounds would look better upon than on me? I'm not going to play the fool and kill myself, that's ridiculous. Okay, so that's his motivation, and that's why if it were a different Shakespearean story or a Roman-influenced one, it would probably be a little bit different. Um, if you've seen, you know, samurai movies, ninja movies, you know, sometimes they prefer to die an honorable death, you know, uh, take their own life, have somebody take it for them in order, instead of being captured. Okay, so that might be where this is coming from. Uh, Macduff, turn, hellhound, turn. Of all men else, I have avoided thee. Well, why did he avoid thee? Well, can you remember the witch's prophecy? Beware, Macduff. And so he says, of all men, I have avoided thee. But get thee back, my soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. What a wonderful guy. Go away, I've already killed too much of the Macduff bloodline. I'm fine, I'm, I'm not thirsty anymore. Okay, so what a, what a jerk. But what a great thing to say if you're trash talking, okay, before the big fight. Um, uh, but, 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 I have no words, so I'm not going to talk to you. I have no words. My voice is in my sword. Thou bloodier villain than terms can give thee out. So more words than I can describe. I can't, I can't talk to you. So I'm going to let my sword, because ultimately that's what he wanted. Put this man within my sword's reach so I can take care of business. Um, Macbeth, thou loosest labor, as easy mayest thou the entrenchant air with thy keen sword and presses make me bleed. So footnote, you can as easily mark the invulnerable air with your sword as make me bleed. You can just wave your thing around. You can't hurt me. There, you can't do anything to me. Okay, there's no point in it. You know, I bear a charmed life which must not yield to one of woman born. Oh. Well, then I'll tell thee, Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. Nowadays, we would call that what? A C-section. So he didn't come out the normal way. We consider, you know, you're born either way. Okay? But do you see how the witches played this differently and played it falsely? Macduff wasn't born the normal way. He was pulled untimely. Something must have happened. He had to come out before he could go through the regular, the regular uh, path, I guess you could say. Um, and so, uh, accursed be that tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my better part of man, and be these juggling fiends no more believed. So I can't believe those witches anymore. And so my downfall, the woods have marched, and now I'm facing a man not born of a woman. And so uh, it looks like I'm, I'm hosed. He goes, I will not fight with thee. All right, well then yield, coward, and live to be the show and gaze of the time. We'll have thee, as our rarer monsters are, painted upon a pole and under it. Here may you see the tyrant. So we're going to make you a circus. We're going to lead you in front of everybody and say, here is the tyrant. I will not do that. Okay, now he has his honor. I will not yield. I will not stop fighting. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet. Though Burnham would be come to Dunsinane, and thou opposed, being of no woman born, yet I will try the last. I will keep fighting until I am killed, if I am to be killed. Even though all these things, the, the, <laughs> it looks like I'm pretty host. 
but I will not yield at this point. I'm going to keep fighting. Lay on McDuff and damn it be him. That first cries hold enough. And so they fight. They fight. This, the version I saw, he was killed off stage um, because I wanted to see him come back on with a head, but he didn't. And so they kind of see his feet still on stage as, you know, as the play ends. Um, but uh, so he takes off and he decapitates the body and comes back in carrying a, you know, the head because if we remember back from our Beowulf, you know, that would be proof that Grendel was dead, would be to have the head. Um, on 401, while that's happening, everybody's kind of, we're done fighting. We've won. We've, we've taken the castle. Everything's fine. Um, we find out Seward, his younger son, young Seward, was killed. And he finds out that he was dead. But he asks an important question. Um, had his hurts before, had his hurts been on front, had he been wounded on the front as opposed to the back? Because if it's on the front, he was facing the, the damage, facing the fight. If it got him in the back, what was he doing? Don't hurt me. Right? Running away. He didn't have a warrior's death if it was on the back. And so he's like, he had a warrior's death. I'm very proud. It was on the front. Um, why then God's soldier be he? So I lost a son, but I know that God has a really good soldier up there now. Um, so these characters, that the C word and his dad, really not you know important. We you know barely were they even present in this piece, but yet we have a nice little moment there, um, really to kind of just be a buffer before we see Macduff walk in. You know, give him enough time that he could realistically <coughs> sever a head. Um, and so he walks on on 402, and he comes on pronouncing, "Hail, King! For so thou art. Behold, where stands the usurper's cursed head." And then everybody, hail, King of Scotland. And then Malcolm wraps it up with the monologue. Just like at the very end of Julius Caesar, the new ruler, he gets to kind of wrap it all up in summation. Um, he says a couple interesting things in here. Um, around line 63, 64. My thanes and kinsmen, henceforth will be earls, the first that ever Scotland in such an honor name. Earls, that's an English nobility. Can we think of why? He would add a noble rank of English to their titles. Well, for King James, maybe a little bit, but the English helped them in the fighting. Seward and Prince Edward gave them 10,000. They could not have defeated Macbeth without them, more than likely. Okay? And so this is a nice little shout out, a combination of the English and, and the Scottish, okay, with the noble ranks. Yes, I think it is in conjunction with, since James I is the king in real life, okay, that this is kind of a, a little shout out, a combination of the two kingdoms, the United Kingdoms. And so it's, I think it's a, a, a very noble thing and, and wise thing that Malcolm did there. Um, let's see. Da, da, da. You know, call, let's call home our exiled friends abroad that fled the snares of watchful tyranny, producing forth the cruel ministers of this dead butcher. So let's, hopefully those that fled, mainly my brother Donald Bain, hopefully everybody that took off can come back and we can have a good, uh, good kingdom. The rightful king is now here. Um, you know, uh, they mention his fiend-like queen, who as tis thought by self and violent hands took off her life. So she killed herself. It doesn't say how. Okay. Back in Julius Caesar, Brutus' wife, she swallows hot coals from the fire because she was so tormented that her husband was exiled and it's been three years and she didn't get to see him. And so she went nuts and could, didn't see a reason for living. So she took, you know, those hot coals and swallowed them. Wow. That's a painful way to go. And so I don't know how she did, but she killed herself as well. As well. And we have the two main characters, Macbeth and Macbeth, tragically, you know, die. And we see their evolution or de-evolution throughout the whole piece. Um, and that's ultimately uh, what is tragic. And the very last line, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, whom we invite to see us crowned at Schoon. So remember, that was the place Macbeth was going to get crowned. So Malcolm has been restored. He's going to go and be crowned. And everything is Great. It's, the, it's a happy ending, I guess, as happy as it could be for the survivors, those that truly wanted Scotland to be what it was. Okay? Um, I'd like for us to take a quick jump back uh, 
to the witches with their apparitions. Uh, four one. Three seventy three. When they say beware, beware Macduff, what apparition <coughs> told him to beware of Macduff? An armored head floating. You see how that kind of plays out? Macduff took Macbeth's head. Look at the second one. A bloody child is the one that said, you know, you shall not be harmed by anyone born of a woman. Okay, so the bloody child being ripped out of the mom. This, well, not like ripped, but cut and pulled out, right? Um, probably a little bit more laborious than the just pulling out. Um, but ultimately the third, how about this one? A crowned child with a, a stick in his hand. With a tree, what do they use? Uh, with a tree in his hand. Remember, who is the crowned child? Malcolm. He should be the king. Okay, he was the Prince of Cumberland, so he is a crowned child carrying a little tree. And ultimately, what did Burnham Wood do? March across. And so this little kid with a tree. Okay? So even though, um, you know, they told him through words that he should be confident and such, the, the visions were not lying. They weren't being deceitful at all. There was no equivocation in the, in the visuals. This is what's going to happen. And just in case you're not good with listening, here's a you know, here are the pictures and such. Um, so I always like to come back to this page because we're like, oh, man, they were pretty obvious with it. But yet the goal was and the enchantment of their words was such that they were going to, he was going to shirk, uh, you know, mankind. And when he should be worried and fearful, he's going to be, you know, arrogant and, and go from there. Um, so that's the end. That's Macbeth. Um, we're, we're done with it. it. It didn't take too long to get through.